Hello, and welcome to today's Lunch and Learn, AFib, Don't Skip a Beat. I'm Dr. Steve Ranches, the President and CEO of North Kansas City Hospital and Meritas Health. Thank you for joining us. Millions of people go undiagnosed with atrial fibrillation. That's when the heart's rhythm speeds up, slows down, or skips a beat. Our expert speaker today, Dr. Richard Mills, will discuss the causes, risk factors, diagnosis, and treatment for this common condition and serious heart condition. Dr. Mills is a cardiologist with Meritas Health Cardiology. His specialty is non-invasive cardiology, which is the non-surgical treatment of heart conditions. He's board certified in internal medicine and cardiovascular disease. Dr. Mills earned his medical degree from Tufts University in Boston. He completed his internal medicine residency at the University of Texas Southwestern in Dallas and cardiovascular fellowship at the University of Missouri, Kansas City. If you have any questions about our topics today, please submit your questions using the Q&A feature below. We will respond at the end of the presentation. And now please join me in welcoming Dr. Mills. Thank you, Dr. Ranches, for that introduction. As you mentioned, atrial fibrillation is a very common problem. In fact, many people in the audience probably have atrial fibrillation. It can have serious implications for their health status. And so I hope that this is a discussion that is of interest to patients and hope people will learn something. So here are our objectives. We'll start by talking about what is atrial fibrillation? Who tends to get it? What are the implications for patients when they're diagnosed with AFib? What is the initial workup and management of atrial fibrillation? Then we'll talk about the stroke risk in patients with AFib and how can we reduce that risk with either blood thinners or the Watchman device. Finally, we'll talk about rhythm and rate control strategies. We'll talk about the medications we can use to control someone's heart rate. We'll talk about antiarrhythmic medic medications. And finally, we'll talk about the AFib ablation procedure. So what is atrial fibrillation? Atrial fibrillation is the most common heart rhythm disturbance in the United States. It's estimated about three to six million people in this country currently have atrial mm -hmm. fibrillation. But for reasons we'll discuss in a few minutes, that number is predicted to rise. And by 2030, it's estimated that there will be 12 million people in this country with atrial fibrillation. We characterize it as a disordered atrial electrical activity, the atrium being the top chambers of the heart. It is an irregularly irregular heart rhythm, which I'll show you on the next slide. It can be either paroxysmal which means that a patient can go in and out of AFib, or it can be persistent or permanent when patients stay in AFib and do not go back into atrial fibrillation into normal rhythm on their own. This is a nice diagram from the Mayo Clinic's website. On the left side of the screen, you can see a normal heart rhythm. The heart electricity that tells the heart to beat comes from the sinus node, which is in the right atrium. And you can see a very well-defined circuitry through which the electrical activity propagates through the heart to tell the heart to contract in an organized fashion. And you can see on the EKG tracing below that heart is a very nice, regular, organized rhythm. In comparison, on the right side of the screen, you can see a patient in atrial fibrillation. The top two chambers, the atria of the heart in, in atrial fibrillation, the electricity is firing erratically. The electricity is firing from hundreds of different locations. It's going very fast in the top chambers. And those Electricity, electrical impulses are randomly being sent down to the bottom chamber of the heart, mm. which makes the heart contract irregularly. And you can see in that EKG, EKG tracing below, it's a very irregular, or we call it irregularly irregular heart rhythm. So who gets AFib? Well, these are the common risk factors. So increasing age, diabetes, patients with heart failure, high blood pressure, obesity, hyperthyroidism, and sleep apnea. And as our patient population becomes older with higher prevalence of obesity and diabetes and sleep apnea, the number of patients developing AFib will continue to increase and increase and become an increasing burden on our healthcare society. What are the symptoms? Well, <clears throat> many patients who are in atrial fibrillation will describe fatigue or just decreased exertional tolerance. They can't do the things they normally can or they may describe palpitations, fluttering, skipped beats in their chest. Some people feel shortness of breath. And many patients will have no symptoms at all and it'll be found incidentally and patients will have no idea that they had atrial fibrillation. There are some serious complications that can occur from atrial fibrillation, such as heart failure, and probably most worrisome is stroke. 
on the right side of the screen here, you can see kind of a natural progression for a patient with atrial fibrillation. They may have a lone or single episode of atrial fibrillation, and then they may go years where they stay in normal rhythm. That bar in the middle of that diagram there shows in blue is a patient being in normal rhythm and red is an atrial fibrillation. And you can see eventually they'll go back in atrial fibrillation, but go back into normal rhythm again. Over time, the episodes of atrial fibrillation will become more frequent and longer lasting until eventually they'll never go back to normal rhythm and they will be permanently in atrial fibrillation. How do we diagnose atrial fibrillation? Well, typically we do it with an EKG. It is a very, gives us a very good high definition picture of someone's heart rhythm. That is only about a 10 second picture in someone's heart rhythm. We may think that they're having atrial fibrillation and we just didn't catch it at the time that we obtained the EKG. And so we can have patients wear longer monitors such as a Holter monitor or event monitor, which they can wear for up to 30 days or so. And as I mentioned before, many patients are symptomatic. And so it may be they go see their primary care doctor and they detect an irregular heart rhythm on exam. They get an EKG and they find atrial fibrillation the patient had no idea about. Nowadays, there are some newer devices that consumers can buy, which can detect AFib, such as the Apple Watch Series 4 or later, or the Cardio Mobile. These are less sophisticated than the monitors that a physician can prescribe, but they actually do produce pretty nice tracings, and patients are being diagnosed with atrial fibrillation just because they happen to be wearing an, an Apple Watch. This is an example of a patient who is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation from their Apple Watch. You can see here, it's actually pretty nice tracing. It's not always the case, but we have made this diagnosis and are making it more often as these devices are becoming more prevalent in the community. I'm gonna switch gears here for a minute and talk about the initial workup and management for a patient with atrial fibrillation. So if a patient is diagnosed with atrial fibrillation, one of the first things we do is grab, get some labs. We wanna make sure their electrolytes are okay, that their kidney function is okay and to see what their thyroid function is, because as I mentioned earlier, high thyroid function can drive someone's atrial fibrillation. In addition, we'll get an echocardiogram, which is an ultrasound of the heart. That ultrasound will normally be look okay, but occasionally we'll find some significant cardiac abnormalities on the echocardiogram, such as significant valvular disease or decreased cardiac function that may be the cause of, H of the patient's atrial fibrillation, and that may need to be addressed as well. In addition, Sleep apnea is a major risk factor for AFib. And if patients have AFib and it's not treated, then the age of fibrillation will be very difficult to control. And so we always screen patients for AFib. If we think that a patient, or excuse me, for sleep apnea, if we think a patient has sleep apnea, we'll refer them to the sleep clinic so they can be formally tested for it. The principles of management for AFib are one, to improve symptoms, and two, to reduce the risk of stroke. And so when someone is first diagnosed with AFib, we'll put them on medications to control their heart rate because atrial fibrillation often causes someone to have a fast heart rate. We will often start a blood thinner medication, and then we'll often talk about maybe trying to get someone back into a normal or sinus rhythm if they have not gone back into it on their own. On the right side of the screen here, you can see what we call a cardioversion procedure. This is a procedure where a patient comes in, has electrical pads placed on their chest, and we sedate them under monitoring and shock them or reboot their heart back into normal rhythm, with the hopes being that they will stay in a normal sinus rhythm for a long time. There's no guarantee that that'll be the case, but the hope would be that they stay in normal rhythm for years, potentially. Now we're going to talk about the risk of stroke and how we prevent that. Atrial fibrillation is one of the biggest risk factors for stroke. And it turns out we can estimate that risk based on the number of other risk factors they have. Those risk factors include heart failure, high blood pressure, age, diabetes, a prior history of stroke, whether they have coronary or vascular disease, and females. And the more points you get in the scoring system, the higher your risk of stroke is, you can see in this diagram. If you only have one or two points, your risk of stroke is not that much higher than someone else comparable at that age. But as you start getting more points, four or five, six points, your risk of stroke goes up from maybe 1% a year to maybe eight, nine, 15% a year. And this guides our decision-making for whether to start a patient on a blood thinner. 
if someone's score is one, then their risk of stroke is low enough that the risks of the blood thinners probably outweigh the benefits, and we typically do not give them the blood thinner. If that score is three or higher, we feel that the risk of stroke is high enough that a patient should be on a blood thinner. And if that score is two, the risks and benefits of the blood thinners are about equal, and, it's, and societies recommend that we have a patient-centered discussion to talk with a patient, decide whether a blood thinner should or should not be prescribed. Blood thinners <clears throat> reduce the risk of stroke by preventing blood clots that form in the heart. The reason stroke happens with AFib is because when the patient is in atrial fibrillation, the top two chambers of the heart are fibrillating or not contracting very well. Blood can stagnate in those chambers and form blood clots. Those blood clots can break off and cause a stroke. So these blood thinners act by reducing the chance that those blood clots will form in the first place. And they're quite effective. They reduce the risk of stroke from AFib by about 60 or 70%. Not 100%, but this is about as good as we get with these medications. Some examples include warfarin, recumidin. This has been around for a long time. It's a very effective medication, but it's finicky. The blood levels can vary widely between patients. And even patients, over time, their blood levels can, can vary. And so they need frequent blood tests to ensure that the warfarin level is not too high or too low. For that reason, we tend to use some of these newer agents, such as apixaban, also known as Eliquis, rivaroxaban with the trade name Xarelto, or dabigatran, also known as Pradaxa. These medications have much more steady blood levels and do not require any blood monitoring. The downside to them is they can be expensive depending on patient's insurance coverage, and we cannot use them with, with valvular atrial fibrillation, which is described as patients with either mitral stenosis, which is a valvular disease, or with artificial heart valves. The major worry and side effect of these medications is they increase your risk of bleeding. Of course, anyone who's on a blood thinner, they are going to bruise more. If they get a cut, they will bleed a little bit more than they would have otherwise. But the bleeds that we worry about are internal bleeds. So bleeds in the intestinal system, or potentially even more worrisome is, is patients who fall, hit their head, and then bleed inside their head. And so there are some people who may be at high risk of stroke but also high risk of bleeding. And the question is how, what can we do for those patients? And there's now a newer device called a watchman that can be appropriate for these patients. It turns out that most of the strokes that cause, most of the clots that cause strokes in atrial fibrillation come from the left atrial appendage, which is basically an outpouching from the left atrium. It looks like an earlobe and it's kind of like your appendix in that it doesn't really have any purpose except causing problems. And so what some of my colleagues can do is they can go into the heart with catheters and they can actually deploy a plug into this left atrial appendage and occlude it so that if any blood clots form in it, they're trapped by this plug and do not break off and cause strokes. In studies, the stroke risk reduction is similar compared to blood thinners. It's an outpatient procedure. There is some pre and post procedure testing required. In most cases, assuming that the device is seated properly, patients can come off blood thinners a few weeks after the device is implanted. And this is a very good option for patients who may be at high risk of bleeding. I'm going to switch gears here and talk about rhythm and rate control now. So rate control is a strategy in which our goal is not necessarily to keep patients out of AFib. Our goal is just to keep their heart rate um, from going too fast. Um, we'll talk about that in a few minutes. And whereas rhythm control is a strategy in which our goal is to restore and maintain a normal rhythm. And we can do that by using either antirhythmic medications or using catheter ablation procedures. Both rate and rhythm control strategies are proven to improve symptoms. In 15 years ago, the evidence would have suggested there wasn't much benefit of one compared to another. And it was kind of left up to providers and patients to decide which strategy to pursue. More recently, evidence has been coming out that if patients deemed to be at high cardiovascular risk, rhythm control may be a favored strategy. One, one such study called the EAST AFNET 4 trial found that in patients who were at high cardiovascular risk, who were assigned to a rhythm control strategy, had decreased rates of cardiovascular death and stroke compared to patients who were assigned to a rate control strategy. And both of them had similar symptom controls. We're still trying to figure out 
which patients should go for ablations or, or rhythm control strategies first. But we're now starting to send more and more patients for rhythm control strategies than we had in the past. So going back to rate control, patients in atrial fibrillation, their heart rate can go fast and that can cause symptoms. But also if someone's heart rate goes too fast for too long, it can weaken the heart. And so our goal is to keep a patient's resting heart rate generally between 60 and 100 beats per minute. The, it doesn't matter so much if your heart rate goes up when you exert yourself, but when you're just sitting there resting, we do not want your heart rate to really be going 120, 130 because of the risk that over time that it might weaken your heart. So we prescribe medications to help prevent that heart rate from going too fast. We can use beta blockers such as metoprolol or carvedilol, calcium channel blockers such as diltiazem, or medication called digoxin. When patients are in the hospital, their atrial fibrillation often be can become uncontrolled. The reason why that's the case is the heart rate is very sensitive to adrenaline. And when patients are sick in the hospital and they're sick with either infections or other things, their adrenaline is surging through their body and their AFib can go very fast. And often we need to use IV medications to bring that heart rate down. So we can use IV metoprolol or an infusion of diltiazem or other medications such as digoxin or amiodrome. The goal will be to transition them off the IV medications and get them back onto the oral outpatient medications. For rhythm control strategy, we can use antirhythmic medications. These are medications prescribed to improve the likelihood of staying in a normal sinus rhythm. However, each of these medications have significant toxicities and safety concerns and should really be monitored by a cardiologist. Some examples include amiodarone with the trade name Pacerone. This is an effective antirhythmic medication, but it can affect your liver, your thyroid, your eyes, and your lungs, all of which need to be monitored every six months or so. Flecainide, also known as Tambacor, has less of these toxicities, but in the wrong patient, it can actually increase the risk of sudden cardiac death. Sotolol and Zofetilide also work well, but they can cause dangerous heart rhythm disturbances. And for them to be started safely, a patient needs to go into the hospital so that the first five doses can be administered and we can EKG after each dose to make sure that they're not at risk of having a dangerous heart rhythm. Mm -hmm. So these are very complicated and burdensome medications to prescribe and monitor. And, and frankly, we're starting to move away from them. And if we're pursuing a rhythm control strategy, we're tending to go more quickly towards a catheter ablation procedure. This is an outpatient catheter-based procedure performed by electrophysiologists who are cardiologists who have further specialized in heart rhythm issues. The electrophysiologist can go up into the heart with a catheter and find those areas in the heart where the atrial fibrillation comes from. And through that catheter, either deliver electricity or cryotherapy or cold therapy. This causes scar tissue to form where that abnormal electricity is coming from and blocks the atrial fibrillation from affecting the rest of the heart. It is quite successful with about a 75% success rate, success rate at one year or being able to keep patients from having any recurrence of AFib at one year. It's a relatively low complication rate, but there are lots of patients out there who need this procedure. And so the wait list can be quite long to get in for it. So to summarize, what have we learned here today? We've learned that AFib is a common arrhythmia. It increases the risk of stroke as well as heart failure. The cornerstones of management are improving symptoms and reducing the risk of stroke. We can reduce the risk of stroke with either blood thinners or the Watchman device. And we can improve symptoms by pursuing either a rate or rhythm control strategy. And we are more frequently moving towards a rhythm control strategy. I think that's all I really have. And I think we have plenty of time for questions. Oh. And, and I want to tell you, when I looked at my watch in the middle of your talk, it wasn't because I was checking your time. I was checking my resting heart rate <laughs> to make sure that I was in the zone. Yeah. Uh, I thought that was a fascinating talk. Uh, we do have some questions from the uh, audience. Here's the uh, first question. Uh, if many patients do not have symptoms, how do they ever find out that they have AFib? That's a good question. Um, you know, what we don't want is for the person to find out they have AFib when they have their first stroke. Mm -hmm. But there's a lot we don't know. Um, if a patient has 
uh, Apple Apple Watch and they find that they had 30 seconds of AFib with the course of the year, we don't really know what that means yet. Mm -hmm. I would say that if it's a, a young 30 year old person, we probably do nothing about it. But if it's someone who is who is you know older, has more risk factors, who may develop a stroke from atrial fibrillation, mm -hmm. it's probably worth it to to look into that further. Is it fair to say that the younger people with AFib flip in and out more commonly or have the uh, or, or the reverse? Do the older patients tend to have more sustained AFib? I, so that's my I, question. I guess what I, what I would say is is when AFib first develops, it tends to be more intermittent or paroxysmal. As time goes on, more scar tissue forms in the top chambers of the heart and patients will spend more time in AFib, it will be harder to get them out of AFib. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, as, as patients get older, as their AFib becomes more chronic, they tend to be in AFib, or as some people say, AFib begets AFib. Okay. Well, here's uh, someone who's listening in. Uh, question from the audience. I have permanent AFib for over three years. I've had conversions, which I- Cardioversions. Cardioversions yeah. that did not take should I consider ablation? I think that's a great question. I think ablations are, are successful, even for a patient who's been in AFib for three years, there's a very good likelihood of having a successful procedure. I think the way I think of it with patients is, is you know, this is a paradigm that's shifting. You know, 15 years ago, we would have said, you're in AFib, you were gonna say in AFib. Mm -hmm. Now, I think my question for the patient would be, what are your symptoms? If you have episodes where you're having palpitations, then absolutely an ablation to try and get you out of AFib will make you feel better. Or if you're someone who has other risk factors for things like heart failure or, or high risk of stroke, then I think an ablation is a reasonable thing. I think it's better to be in normal rhythm than to be in AFib. That being said, you know, I see plenty of patients who come in because their PCP detected AFib and they said, I had no idea, I feel great, I run, I do everything I wanna do. It's hard for me to justify an ablation procedure which has expense, which has complications, although low, for someone who's feeling good. Mm -hmm. You used a word that I know as physicians we use a lot uh, and even the lay folks use this word, but I want you to describe what this symptom is. You use the word palpitations. Mm -hmm. Can you describe for the audience what a palpitation is or what it feels like? It's different for, for everyone. People will describe it as a skipped beat. They feel like their heart stopped for a second. Um, it might be a fluttering, butterflies in their chest. Or as I mentioned, they may just feel, I just feel off. I feel tired. I feel fatigued. I'm short of breath. Mm -hmm. Normally when I walk my dog, I can go this far, but now I have to stop. It be a lot of those things. But okay. typically palpitations are these skipped beats, feeling their heart is beating irregularly. Okay. Uh, here's a second question. Would it be wise to get an Apple Watch or Cardium Mobile to detect AFib on my own? Yeah. That's also a great question. And one that we don't have a lot of evidence for right now. As, as I kind of mentioned earlier, what does it mean for a patient who had 30 seconds of AFib over the course of a year? These are things that you know, the manufacturers are still figuring out mm -hmm. and things that providers are still figuring out. I will say that these Apple Watches and CardioMobile devices, are there's nothing reimbursable for physicians as of right now. And so there are plenty of physicians out there who will refuse to look at them. I often tell patients, if I think someone has AFib, but I have not detected it on a monitor, mm -hmm. I often tell them to get the Cardio Mobile device. It's about $80. You can get it on Amazon or, or probably at a, at a Walgreens or CVS. And I trust it enough that if I suspect they have AFib, then if they can send me a strip that shows it on their device, then I'll say, yeah, you have AFib. So describe the Cardio Mobile. I saw the picture on the slide in somebody with two yeah. fingers. Is it something separate than your cell phone? So there's several versions of it. Um, there's one that looks like a stick and you just put your two fingers on it mm -hmm. and then it sends a PDF document to your phone, which you can then email to providers. There's one that looks like a credit card and actually fits in your wallet. And it's the same thing. You pull it out and if you think you're having an, an arrhythmia, you can just put your fingers on it, records it for about 30 seconds and it makes a nice tracing. Okay. Um, what I would say is, you know, if you 
are worried you're having atrial fibrillation, I think it's reasonable to get one of these devices. The CardioMobile is, is relatively affordable. And if you have, if you if your device tells you you have AFib, tell your primary care doctor about it. Mm -hmm. They may or may not be willing to look at it. Depends on their practice um, policy. But they may be willing to send you or have a more, a more official monitor, um, such as a Holter monitor, that that is you know proven FDA proven to diagnose AFib. Okay, great. Uh, if a patient doesn't want to take a blood thinner, is it recommended every time to get a Watchman, or how do you make that decision if they don't want to be on blood thinners and they have yep. AFib? So the Watchman device is, is as I mentioned, it's, it's equivalent to blood thinners as far as the reducing the risk of stroke. Whether, you know, whether a patient can get it done just because they don't like taking a blood thinner is, I think, uh, kind of questionable whether insurance is willing to cover that or not. I would say, though, that if there's any bleeding concerns, if the patient has had bleeds or if we feel that they are, that they are at risk of having significant bleeds, then it's a very good device. Okay. Another question from the audience is exercise recommended for patients with permanent AFib. Uh, this particular listener monitors his beats per mi minute when exercising to ensure that he stays in range. He has not seen a significant increase in its beats per minute when he exercises. Yeah. AFib, uh, so exercise is, is still recommended for AFib. Um, mm -hmm. It's good for the heart. It, it probably I don't know if it's going to prevent, you know, further AFib, but it's not going to hurt it anymore. The heart rate, we worry less about the heart rate when someone is exercising. And that's because it's normal for your heart rate to increase mm -hmm. when you exercise. And so as long as you're not pushing it, you know, to 200 beats a minute or something like that, it's probably fine. If you're, if you're, you know, exercising, you're going 140, 150 beats per minute. I wouldn't worry about that at all. Okay. Another question from the audience, who should undergo a rhythm control strategy for AFib versus uh, um, a rate control strategy versus sublation? Can you kind of go through that again, how you choose rate control and rhythm control yeah. as a decision? So this is a paradigm that is changing as we speak. I think as the years go on, we are, we are moving more and more towards a rhythm control strategy. I would say if someone comes to me with a new diagnosis of AFib, mm -hmm. if they're still in AFib, I will try to get them out of it with a cardioversion and we'll see what happens. Because many times they will stay in normal rhythm for years and that would be the hope. But if they've gone back into AFib and they have symptoms, then I think at that point I would send them to talk to electrophysiologist about an, an ablation procedure. I don't like to use the antiarrhythmic medications because I think there's too much risk of having a side effect or toxicity from them. And so if I think someone needs a rhythm control strategy, I, I refer them for an ablation. Great, great. Well, I thought this was fascinating. And thank you very much, thank Dr. You. Mills. Yeah. We hope this presentation was informative and helpful. And join us June uh, 27th on Tuesday for Arthritis Pain, Get the Basics with Dr. Stephen Reinches, Jr., a neurosurgeon with Meritas Health Neurosurgery. Again, thank you for joining us and have a good afternoon.